Okay, hello everybody. This is uh, Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Uh, tonight we're continuing in our study of the book of Proverbs, and we're going to begin with chapter 22 tonight. Uh, if you did not watch the previous studies, uh, I hope you will go back and watch them all. Uh, it's They're uploaded on my YouTube channel, Sin City Preacher. Uh, with me again tonight is Brother Eric, so say hi to everybody before we get started. Hello, everybody. It's me again, the homo. Okay. You know how to hook up with me. Okay, back to you, Brother Luke. All right. Hope everybody will subscribe to Brother Eric's channel. And we're going to pick up here again in Proverbs, beginning at chapter 22. I'm a KJV firstist, so I'll read it in the KJV. And then I'll probably look at it in the Amplified because it's like reading a commentary. It may help us understand it. It says, chapter 22, verse 1, A good name is rather to be chosen than great riches, and loving favor rather than silver and gold. Well, that, I think that's pretty, pretty plain language, brother. What, what's your reaction to that? Well, I was kind of thinking uh, differently, and uh, I can't understand how you could think it was just plain language. Can you explain yourself? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I will. I'm, um, it seems pretty clear to me, the language, uh, as just as I read it, but I'll read it in the Amplifieds, and you'll, I think you'll see that uh, how they explain it. A good name, that's an earned by honorable behavior, godly wisdom, moral courage, and personal integrity. That means your, your reputation. If you have a good reputation, um, is, is more desirable than great riches. So it's, it's uh, some people want to have riches, uh, but this is telling us that even more valuable is a good reputation, an, an earned reputation, because you've lived a life where people do admire you and respect you. And then it says, finally, and favor is better than silver and gold. Uh, favor, um, loving favor, it says in the KJV. Yeah, so if, if people love you, and, uh, you know, they favor you, they, they like you, and they want to do th anything they can for you because that's how much they think of you. He says that's better than having silver and gold. So, I mean, you, I don't know if everybody will agree. Some people probably would prefer to have silver and gold than a good reputation, and a lot of people that love them and favor them. But uh, <laughs> it's, it, there's, it's saying if you really have your priorities right, you should put more value on your reputation and, and your uh, friendships and good favor. And that's the core of the issue, isn't it? So many people choose riches over what really matters in life. And Jesus said, what does it profit a man? to gain the whole world and lose his own soul. Okay, back to you. Yeah, yeah. And uh, and he, he also said that uh, uh, don't try to build up treasures on earth uh, because they're only temporary. Build up your treasures in heaven. And the treasures we get in heaven, of course, are the rewards we get for uh living a good life after we were became christians um it's our it's our walk as a christian it's our ministry as a christian the things we do uh those are the the, the things that we're going to get treasures in heaven so it is um uh, many many people have the long the wrong priorities uh, i remember in a previous chapter in proverbs it was also talking about getting rich and trying to trying to do it by taking shortcuts, by being dishonest and lying and, you know, but uh, I think this verse here is saying that uh, don't put so much value and don't desire so much material wealth right now 
it's uh, it's more valuable. It's more important for you to build up your good character and friendships. And as Jesus said, your treasures in heaven. I'll go on unless you want to add to that. Uh, that's good. Okay, let's go on. Okay. All right. Verse 2 says, the rich and poor meet together. The Lord is the maker of them all. Hmm. Hmm. Well, I see that a lot uh, in the uh, industry. Uh, we got all these poor Mexicans working, and then they got the rich supervisors right there uh, with the whips, beating them over the backs. Back to you. Well, it says they meet together, um, but in the Amplify it says that that's, that's the commonality, that we're all um, part of humanity. We have that in common, that whether you're rich or poor, we're all equally human. Uh, but even though the rich and poor are sharing the earth, uh, it's... Um, you know, there, there's so much to be said about, you know, not not trying to desire so much material wealth and, and think of to be heavenly minded rather than earthly minded. Someone said that some people are so heavenly minded, they're of no earthly good. They're just thinking about heaven. But I, I found that, that true, that's not a really true saying. Uh, almost all people are earthly minded. <laughs> they're not thinking about heaven and when i did that teaching on heaven it was uh 50 hours long um uh, that and that gave us a chance to really focus on heaven study it so thoroughly that it got we got so happy and so excited about all these promises we we'll, we have in for in eternity and uh that's that's heavenly minded and it's a wonderful thing to be heavenly minded and uh uh, instead of thinking about, well, well, how can I do really good now? How can I enjoy life right now? Hey, it's Brother Neo. Oh, I gotta, I gotta let him on. Okay. Yeah, I had to give him the approval. Yeah. Hey, brother. I'm, I'm approved here, sir. You are certified and approved as a saint. Yeah, I was reading. Uh, I was reading Proverbs today. Uh, one that just came to mind was Proverbs four seven. I was hearing you talk. But yeah, that one's pretty amazing for me. Is you know, wisdom is the principal thing. Yeah. Well, the the whole point of Proverbs really boils down to wisdom, uh, and uh, and and the nice nice thing about it is it, it he he teaches through contrast. He's always contrasting the wise man versus the fool, and and uh, and he'll say like. This guy's diligent, a hard worker. He's going to have a lot of uh, good things happen in his life. On the other hand, this guy's foolish because he's lazy and he won't get out of bed and go to work. And it's just, it's a it's really a great way to learn these virtues, these principles for life. Um, what was the verse that you just quoted again? Uh, four seven. Basically, the beginning. It's kind of like echoing the beginning of knowledge, or the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but. It's uh, Proverbs 4.7 uh, says, Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom, and with all thy get getting, get understanding. So, I mean, it's almost like God wants us to be intelligent people. And, like, when I used to be a non-believer, I, I thought that Christians didn't want to know anything more because, you know, like they, they, they just cease to want to know any kind of knowledge. But that's not true. The Bible actually commands us to be intelligent people. Yeah, uh, we we're uh, we're taught here, especially in the book of Proverbs, that uh, getting knowledge and understanding is something we should strive for, uh, and wisdom is uh, knowledge applied properly. Um, I mean, some people acquire knowledge, but they don't apply it in their lives, so that's unwise. But the, there's a person can gain a lot of wisdom. Uh, and yet still fail in the one thing that's most important, and that is what Paul said in, in Timothy, uh, wisdom unto salvation. 
you know, they get wise about everything, everything under the sun, but they never get the wisdom about how to how to get saved. And so that's why we never we don't want to neglect that part. Every every broadcast, we're going to make sure they at least hear the the wisdom unto salvation. Uh, I'm glad you could join us tonight, Brother Neil. Uh, have you been uh, busy working and uh, busy on other hangouts and stuff? Yeah, a little bit here and there. I haven't been really doing much. But, um, yeah, I love that uh, scripture you just noted was uh, Ecclesiastes 1, 4, or 11 or something like that. Uh, there's nothing new under the sun. One of my best friends, we call him Morpheus. We call him Morpheus because he's like, you know, he kind of looks like the guy from the movie. And he sits in a, he sits in a chair just like the one that Eric's sitting in. But... <laughs> <laughs> I love Eric's chair. It looks like the one from the movie. But yeah, uh, he's talking about there's nothing new under the sun. No matter what anybody on this planet tells you, none of this stuff is new. There's, I mean, it's all the same stuff. It's just been materialized a different way. You know, I we're we're doing we're alternating uh, themes on these uh, studies, uh, proverbs. Um, the uh, book of John, uh, the book of Job, and the topic early church history. And I'm thinking already ahead, and I, I believe that I want to take on Ecclesiastes at some point. As soon as we finish one of these, we'll fill in a gap and probably add in Ecclesiastes uh, because uh, I haven't really studied it out really thoroughly. Of course, I've read it numerous times, but it's just like reading, reading uh, the book of Job, I mean, I've read it over the years, but now that we're really studying it, I mean, it's it's just so much more meaningful when you take the time to really study it in depth. So I'm looking forward to getting on to Ecclesiastes uh, here uh, eventually. All right, I'm going to go on in, uh, in the... Yeah, I heard you. Go ahead. Okay. It says uh, Proverbs 22, verse 3 now. Uh, it says, uh, a prudent man foreseeth the evil and hideth himself, but the simple pass on and are punished. <laughs> uh, Brother Eric, does this apply to what we were talking about before we went live? Uh, okay, I can't remember that far back, Brother Luke. <laughs> we were talking about the great Christian martyrs of history and how the church grew so quickly during the greatest times oh. of persecution and uh, of course if you know you're going to be persecuted you could flee a lot of Christians fleed especially when there was persecution started in Jerusalem they fleed they fled all over and that helped the church grow because uh, Christians spread out uh, some people could recant if they're challenged they could recant their faith some did that uh, but most of them were taken away in chains and burned or beheaded or or eaten by wild beasts. And the, the accounts of the, all these martyrs is just, uh, it's really, really impressive, the, the, the faith they have. But in this, Brother Eric was saying uh, if, if he was persecuted, he'd, he'd give him the gospel. But, but then after that, he's not going to turn the other cheek. I think, I think he's got maybe a 357 Magnum or something. But, back there, don't you? <laughs> but I, uh, I can't uh, tell other people what to do. I don't know what I would do if uh, under those certain... You don't know, really know until the time comes. But here it says, A prudent man foreseeth the evil and hideth himself, but a simple pass on and are punished. Uh, so if we apply this to life in general, then uh, it's, um, it's one thing. But then it, you could also apply it towards, uh, you know, uh, times of persecution uh, for our faith. And so let me get your response in, in both those ways. That was a great example, Brother Luke. And uh, thank God that Jesus set us at liberty so we can flee persecution if we please. Or we can stand there and take it if we please, or if love demands it, we could stand our ground and fight it for those who are entrusted to our protection. Okay, back to you, Brother Luke.
Yeah, I was just looking at Proverbs uh, 22 here. Pretty awesome stuff. Uh, how about teaching a child? I had to recently come to grips with even having a child, let alone, you know, and to me, what felt like a world full of hell at, at, a, at a certain time, you know, it's like I didn't want to have a child because I was afraid of him growing up in this crazy world, you know, and stuff like that, but I kind of got, got over that fear with uh, Proverbs 22, we might get there eventually, um, uh, 22, 6, that's what we want it is. Uh, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Well, I think that's a pretty awesome verse for me. That certainly is our hope, but I, I don't. I'm not sure it's it's certain. I don't. I don't think it, we're really guaranteed that. Some people train up their children well in the scriptures, and uh, and sometimes the children do depart. But uh, that's our hope, that if we give them the right foundation, that they will hold on to it and, and always love it and cherish it. But sometimes people, kids, go off to universities and they get all confused and turned around because of the, the, the liberal ideas that they're, they're exposed to in universities. I, I, I've met a lot of people that that's their fear of their children growing up, leaving the house, and then going off and being exposed, exposed in the world. And Yeah. You know, there's some statistics on that, that college kids were, uh, uh, they did kind of a poll on and seeing how many college kids lost their belief um, after they left college. I think the number was up there in the 70s or something like that about kids that went into college with a certain belief system and came out of college with the belief, not in atheism, but maybe agnosticism, or like a, not what they entered college with. Uh, funnily enough, they also did the same uh, statistic thing on people in jail. Although I think the number was really high on jail, the people that went in non-believers and came out believers. It was crazy. <laughs> so uh, I guess it's, it's better to go to jail than to the university, isn't it? I wouldn't say that. Yeah, you know. <laughs> but no, I'm, I'm lucky to be uh, lucky enough to have my belief so strongly before I entered college because I entered college late due to a bunch of accidents in my life and things. Uh, that uh, didn't enable me to go to college at the time. Uh, so I'm like in my 30s trying to get through college. But, you know, uh, I think um, I think knowing that the system is kind of corrupt in a way helps get through it because you're just kind of, like for me, I'm just kind of like whatever. I'm just getting through it just to get through it. I don't care what kind of lies they're trying to teach me. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Well, let's... Uh... Let me uh, continue with the, the previous verse, and we'll get back to that verse again as when we or get to it. Um, I was thinking about this in one way, verse 3, uh, A prudent man foreseeth the evil and hideth himself, but the simple pass on and are punished. Uh, but uh, as, when I'm reading the Amplified, it has a totally different... Uh, perspective on it than I did. I, I'm, I'm seeing it as if you're prudent, that's another word for wisdom, a, a wise man can see evil ahead and he hides himself, he avoids it. Uh, but the simple, the people who are not wise, they're not paying attention, they're, uh, they're just, uh, they, they, they pass on, they pass on and are punished. In other words, they, they walk right into, uh, I, I'll compare this to um, uh, martial arts training. I, I, I've trained martial arts all my whole life. I've had, I've owned and operated martial arts schools many years ago. And uh, somebody said to me once, uh, of course, I've had to physically use it a few times in my life. But, but someone said to me, when's the last time you used your martial arts training on some? I said, well, tonight I did. They said, you, you got in a fight tonight? I said no, I, no. But when I when I came over here and I, I looked for a parking place, I parked right directly under a light pole where there's plenty of light. And they said, "How's that using your martial arts?" I said, "Well, the the first thing in, in martial arts is learning how to uh, avoid the conflict, 
and uh, and you do that by uh, being alert all the time and looking around for danger and being always being alert instead of having your head in the sand and not paying attention and uh, so that's what I that's the way that I was seeing this verse is let me read it again the prudent man foreseeth evil so in other words you're alert you're you're paying attention you don't you're not just like your heads in the clouds and not looking around and then finally you realize you're surrounded by a bunch of evil people um, uh, but when I read this in the amplified it's it, it seems to have a total different meaning according to them it says a prudent and far-sighted person sees the evil of sin and hides himself from it but the naive continue on and are punished by suffering the consequences of sin. Uh, I didn't really get that out of reading it in the KJV, but what's your, uh, what's your reaction to that verse? Brother Luke, I like your application much better. Uh, I love the fact that uh, martial arts is found in the book of Proverbs. Okay, back to you. <laughs> That's pretty funny. Um, yeah, that, I love those that verse. Um, sorry, excuse me, my wife. I gotta take care of some things real quick. <laughs> I, I I don't know if uh, uh, brother Neo can hear still hear me now, but brother Eric, it, it, I thought I heard somebody in the background speaking in tongues. Is that what that was? That sound sounded like a rug rat to me. Yeah, a baby crying. They were speaking in tongues. Okay. Yeah. See, see, see. I, I when I try to be funny, no, you just don't. It doesn't have any impact. <laughs> I think it was funny. <laughs> okay. He definitely does speak in a different language. <laughs> Okay, so let me go on then, unless you guys want to talk about verse 3 any further. Uh, verse 4, KJV says, By humility and the fear of the Lord are riches and honor and life. Humility. Well, we know about the fear of the Lord. We talked about that probably a hundred times so far, studying all these books of Proverbs, uh, all these chapters. Uh, but humility, uh, I don't recall us really discussing the word humility that much but it says by humility and the fear of the Lord are riches and honor and life uh, now riches uh, again we're talking about what do you want riches now that are temporary or do you want riches treasures in heaven honor do you want honor now among people that'd be nice but I'd, I'd, I'd rather hear a great uh, 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 commendation from our Lord uh, well done, my good and faithful servant. That's the kind of honor I was hoping for. And it says, and life, well, life, um, it's uh, life everlasting that I'm con I, I want. I've already had 65 years of life, and I'll probably have 10 or 20 more maybe. But uh, the, the, even, it, even if you live a, a long life, it's just a drop in the bucket compared to eternal life. So it's, it's life everlasting that is really uh, the prize. And we get that as a free gift uh, if we just put our faith in Jesus. But the, the word that's, that stands out to me in this verse is says, by humility. So how does the word humility relate to everything I just said? Well, Brother Luke, I don't know. But I will tell you this. The ultimate act of humility is bending your knee at the foot of the cross of Jesus Christ and receiving his free gift of salvation that we can't earn by any means. Okay, back to you. Uh, yeah, I think you answered my question correctly. In, in my opinion, that was the correct answer. Uh, you, people I've encountered over the years... Um, especially here on YouTube, a lot of these people talk about a prerequisite for salvation. you got to promise to stop your sinning. you got to be sad and uh, have a 
broken heart over your sin and repent and or you you got to have a cer certain state of mind and, but but to me um, a person can put their faith in Jesus and and have a variety of a state of mind when I came to Jesus uh, it wasn't with a, a broken heart or repentance over sin it was uh, thankfulness for his love and sacrifice for me I was just I was in tears not of contrition and of brokenness over my sin I was in tears of joy thinking Jesus you love me that much I mean like that song who am I when you think of the whole universe the vastness of the universe and you condense it down to the earth and then then just me as a person on the earth I am not even like one molecule I'm not much more than a molecule in the universe and yet God the creator of all things thinks enough of me that he would die for me he loves me that much and that's what shook me up that's what me made me praise Jesus and thank him and, 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 and want him as my savior and uh, so people can come to Jesus with uh, various frames of mind there's not one way that is like the right way the only way but to me if I was going to uh, promote a, a a quality I would say the quality that we need to have to come to Jesus is that state of humility as you said when we're when we when we are humbled and say oh I thought I could get to heaven by being really religious and being really good and but now I realize it's it's futile it's 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 impossible I, I need to be saved and uh, I'm humbled just like that that tax collector praying at the temple he just fell on his face and said God have mercy on me a sinner he was completely humble but the Pharisee was full of pride and boasting about his good works and so I think of the, the state of mind if I was going to say a certain state of mind uh, is generally is what leads people to salvation I'd say that state of mind is humility is brother Neo still there he's probably gone taking care of his child okay brother Eric that's a great testimony. Oh, go ahead, Brother Neil. After you, after you, sir. That's a great testimony, Brother Luke. Okay, back to you, Neil. <laughs> yeah, that whole work salvation thing you mentioned. Uh, uh, you know, you don't do these things for Jesus. Jesus does them for you. Uh, your works are useless compared to His grace, in a way. Um, no matter what you do, it's not going to change what he's already done for you. So, and also to be rich in spirit, not of the world. Um, you know, I think being rich of the world is like, you know, having, I think what you described to me as like a match trigger. Basically, it's something that's just like that. Yeah, you have something in your mind that makes you aware of God. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge and so on. Yeah, and that's that's that point of awareness where it, it it not only scares the crap out of you, but then it makes you humble after that. I would say in a way, you're like, oh, and then you're like, oh, that I forgot about that, and then you're like, okay, so now I know what's going on, and I'm humbled by it. You know what I'm saying? So that's that's important for a lot of Christians to go through, and most Christians I talk to, 99% of them would say that. That they had uh, something that changed their mind forever. Yes, there's that language you were talking about in the background. Sorry. Yeah, you're you're. Is it a little boy or a girl? Little boy. He's almost uh, ten months now. Almost. Yeah, he's uh, already learned to speak in tongues. I see. Yeah. <laughs> I wish we could speak like them. Goo goo ga ga, ba ba da da, mama da da. <laughs> Yeah, pretty soon he'll be t telling you no. That's usually the first word that they learn because... I have been avoiding using that word. I have been avoiding using that word around him at all. <laughs> all right. Um, so uh, let me read that in the Amplified. It's interesting uh, it, it, how it states it. It says, the reward of humility, that is, having a realistic view of one's importance, and the reverent, worshipful fear of the Lord is riches, honor, and life. Hmm. I like the way they phrased it. 
Yeah, like not of the world, but of rich in spirit of life, you know. Okay, I'll go on to the next verse, and it's uh, verse 5. Thorns and snares are in the way of the froward. He that doth keep his soul shall be far from them. Okay, who wants to figure out that uh, jigsaw puzzle? Yeah, try not to fall into Satan's traps. Obviously, Satan's a lot older than we are. Uh, he has already set up traps for all of us individually. He has that kind of time. He knows. I don't remember the definition of froward. I believe uh, Froward is the person that is uh, has a um, stern look all the time. That's real serious and, and won't smile. Has like a like that. That's Froward. But let me see. I'll look at it in the Amplified. It says, uh, "Thorns and snares are in the way of the obstinate, for their lack of honor and their wrongdoings trap them. He who guards himself with godly wisdom." will be far from them and avoid the consequences they suffer. So yeah, Don't go picking a bar fight with a bunch of uh, biker dudes. I mean, that's pretty good. <laughs> right. Yeah, it's uh, avoiding uh, certain people is certainly as wise. Um, now, I, uh, I've been in, purposely put myself into situations particularly in street preaching sometimes where it's been uh, you go on purpose into a into like the lion's den I remember preaching here in Las Vegas on New Year's Eve and in Las Vegas might be the maybe the, the first or second most popular place in the country for people to celebrate New Year's Eve and on the on the Las Vegas strip it's about maybe a half a mile long or a mile and and on that that street is closed off for for um, at probably around 6 p.m. or they close it off to um, car traffic and it's just the people fill up the streets the street is completely filled with people there's maybe 300 or 400 thousand people celebrating and they're all drunk on drugs and just want to do the craziest things and uh, and then you know we'd be there with bullhorns and telling about trying to tell them about Jesus and uh, well, a lot of signs and banners and and so it that's purposely going into a hostile in, a environment where you know you're going to get a lot of s strife at you and uh, we did it but I'm not sure how wise it really really is to do that I I think that um, the chances of somebody actually benefiting from the message in that scenario is very, very slight. Uh, you have a huge audience, but they're they're not really listening. They're drunk and angry, and they would like to just string you up. But so it could be for our own ego. I think, and there's usually about you know 40 or 50 street preachers that would come to Las Vegas. We'd have an annual convention, and we'd all go out there together. And, We'd be spread out along the street, and I, I think a lot of it was ego, uh, ego, the street preacher ego, thinking I'll go right into this environment and I'll show how courageous I am to preach in in front of these this crowd. But I don't. I looking back on that, I'm not sure it was wise, and prudent, and and really beneficial. Um, according to this Proverbs here. The wise thing is uh, don't, don't put yourself in situations like that. Just avoid situations. Like you said, you don't go into a, a biker bar if you're not a, one of the bikers. You don't go in there and, and uh, you know, unless you expect trouble, you know. All right, let me move on to the next verse. Here's the verse you brought up. 
train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is when he is old, he will not depart from it. Let me read it in the Amplified right now too. I want to see certain but one of these words it says, train up a child in the way he should go, teaching him to seek God's wisdom and and will for his abilities and talents. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. Uh, what do you think about a verse that says something so emphatic, so declarative? So uh, this is a statement of fact. They will not depart from it. And yet I know that some people do an excellent job of raising their children uh, with the scriptures and... and uh, and yet, the kids do depart from it. How do you explain that? Of course they'll depart, Brother Luke. But when they're old, they won't. They'll return by the time they're old. You can take that to the bank. Just tr You have to. It, it won't be true unless you're hoping in the promise. If you're not hoping and believing in that promise, it won't be true for you. But now my unified theory does say that that promise can be taken at face value and I'm hoping for many, many souls that have departed from the Lord that they will return by the time they are old. And I'm believing that they will, according to scriptures. Okay, back to you guys. Hmm, yeah, I, I, like, I like the point you made there. And uh, uh, that, that is... Uh, that's very hopeful, and I, I, I like to think that's that's true. Some people may not be able to return because when we're young and crazy, we end up having a short life because we're so foolish and so reckless. Um, but I think it is likely that uh, if a person survives the craziness of their youth, then they depart, but they re they may very likely return as they get older. See, in my case, though, brother, I don't know about you, Eric, and I know that uh, Brother Neil is still very young. Uh, I think he's just in his early 20s. I, uh, I'm 65, but I didn't get saved until I was 36. So uh, I've often thought about the young believers I've met here on YouTube, the people who get saved as a young person, and then they have to go off to college, and and they have they have this uh, these hormones going going crazy, and they've uh, they've got all these temptations. They go to college, and there's all this partying going on. There's all this promiscuity, and they have the the sex drive that's off the charts, and and some of these people they set aside their faith. Uh, they because they feel that they uh, uh, they're not strong enough to uh, abstain from these things like drunkenness and drugs and sexuality and uh, so they set their faith aside even denounce it because they they would if the to me the most uh, the most uh, miserable person is a Christian that's living in sin. Uh, they're miserable because they have this guilty conscience. The Holy Spirit is convicting them, so they can't really be happy in the sin. So they got to set it aside and get it kind of tune it out. They, they, uh, the Scripture says that they uh, grieve the Spirit. The Spirit's convicting them: don't get drunk, don't take drugs, don't go to that party, and don't have the sex. And they, but they want to do it because the fleshly part says yes. And the Holy Spirit, so they just tune out the Holy Spirit and they grieve it. And finally, they quench the Spirit. And then they go on with their life. They go through a period of time uh, thinking that they're enjoying all these things in the youth that are seem to be so much fun. And, and, and then, as you said, maybe years later, they start listening to the Spirit again and they return. In my case, I got saved so late at age 36 that I had already done all those things. I had been through college. I had been through a period in my life where I did all those uh, those things that uh, I, I I hope other people don't do, but I did them. And and so in that way, 
I can see the advantage of actually getting saved a little bit later rather than getting saved real young. And then you go and you have to deal with all these temptations. I mean, what do you think about that? Well, uh, the chances of coming to the Lord at a later age, uh, apparently, according to odds, are very slim. Uh, I came to the Lord at the age of 16 and uh, had a great time with the Lord for the first year. And then after that, uh, I fell into a 30-year slumber. And uh, I just recently woke up at uh, 2011 and uh, just recently started evangelizing a year ago. And, uh, but... Those 30 years were very difficult. You're absolutely right. Okay, back to you. Yeah. So I do think that it's, it's, it, it, is, uh, not, is it, it is not uncommon for someone to get, they get saved at a young age and they'll go through a period of backsliding for the reasons we've been discussing. And it's, uh, that's the, to me, that's the story of the prodigal son. So they get saved, they become a son of God, and yet they say, give me my inheritance, I'm going to go off and party. And they leave their father, and they go off, and, and they end up in the pig's pen. And then they eventually recognize their mistake and come back, and they, they never stop being the son. They were they, the father's always waiting with their arms outstretched, waiting unconditionally to come back. So it's it's good news that if you're a Christian that got saved and you you you've gotten backslidden and it, it, maybe it's been a, a you know months or or maybe years or decades, uh, there's no reason why you can't come back. Uh, our our great God and Savior Jesus has his arms outstretched. Just, just like he stretched him out on the cross, he still has them outstretched, waiting to embrace you back. And uh, the nice thing is, when you put your faith in him, you become a, a, a child of God. You are born again. And uh, no matter what you did after that, you may get backslidden, but you don't ever get unborn again. <laughs> you're, you're saved. Even, even while you were in the pig's pen, you were saved. Brother? Amen, Brother Luke. And scripture says we are confident that the Lord will finish the work that he started in you. So they'll be back, Brother Luke. They're all going to be back. I believe that. Okay, back to you. All right, brother. Uh, let me see now. Let me go to the next verse here. Um, that was verse 6. Verse 7, the rich ruleth over the poor, and the borrower is servant to the lender. Mm -hmm. That's a pretty famous one. Uh, you hear that a lot. Mm -hmm. It seems pretty straightforward. Uh, uh, and this is, we, we live in America and uh, it, people call it the land of opportunity. And people from all over the world still try to get in here by the by the millions every year because I mean maybe there's some other great places in the world I mean I, I think that uh, there probably are some countries in Europe and we got Canada and we got Australia there's probably a lot of great places to live but we we know that in America we we have a lot of freedom and we have a lot of opportunity and people want to come here so it's it's very easy to uh, uh, you know, strive for, for and success and, you know, have an abundant life. Uh, but the rich, we will always have a rich and a poor class. Well, in America, we have, they call it three classes, the rich, the middle class, and the poor. And some people think that the middle class is disappearing. But um, we have a variety, a, a range of, of uh, financial situations for people. But even the poorest people here in America, most of them, I mean, I went to Del Taco or Taco Bell and, and they, their dollar menu, I mean, you can buy things for a dollar. 
I mean, you, you, for, for just a couple of dollars, you can have a, a meal and um, even the poorest people, you know, they, they don't have to go hungry. We've got uh, food everywhere. It's cheap. And even if you're not living in the street, but you're, you're, you're living uh, a life that's uh, where you don't have a high income, the, our poor people, they have a roof over their head. They have automobiles. They have, uh, they have color television sets. They have computers. They have iPhones. Even the poor people. We call them poor, but look what they have. So we really, uh, we really are blessed and fortunate in this country, but there are still a lot of places in the world where the rich really rule over the poor. There is a discrepancy between the rich and the poor, and the poor are almost like a slave class still in much of the world. The borrower is the servant to the lender. Well, what do you say about that part of it? Um, that's absolutely true, right? Uh, sure. I think that it took me many years to learn about uh, being responsible financially, but eventually I did learn and I got successful. But uh, one of the things that uh, is um, can be a big problem is borrowing money, going into debt. And uh, I, I think that it'd be it, one thing you can do if you want to really do one wise thing in your life is try not to get into debt. You know, uh, if you could be debt free, then you are free. If, if 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 you are in debt, then it's you're the servant to the lender. Um, let me see if we have time for another verse here. I think, uh, why don't we stop there after verse 7. Let me make a note. It'll be Proverbs 22, we did 7. So it'll be Proverbs 22, 8 is where we'll pick up next time in the study. Um, Let's take a few minutes now um, and, and talk about the, uh, the free gift of salvation. I made a video, brother, I, I think you probably saw it. I made a short video a few days ago titled um, Free Gift Theology. And a lot of us here on YouTube, particularly the, 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 our closest friends on YouTube, we have a kind of a a term that we use to, to identify us our, our, our type of believing it's called fr free grace theology now I was suggesting that we train ourselves to use the term free gift theology because I, I want to emphasize, emphasize the word gift because this is the biggest problem people have in the world is that they think that um, eternal life in heaven is a reward for good behavior. That's what almost everybody in the world today thinks. Almost everybody who's ever lived throughout history thinks that if you live a good life, if you do good, your reward is heaven. But what we want them to understand is that heaven is not a reward for good behavior. Heaven is a gift from Jesus to all those who put their faith in him. Now, what's the difference if you were going to define the word reward and gift, what's the difference between a gift and a reward, brother? Uh, well, a reward would be earned, but a gift is given. It would have to be free. Okay. Yes. That's why I call it free gift theology. And there are verses in the Bible that refer to salvation and eternal life in heaven as a free gift. So uh, if you're watching this now and you've never been taught this before, we want you to understand this is what we would call wisdom unto salvation. 
I mean, you could be wise about not going into debt. You could be wise about avoiding violent people and staying out of trouble. There's a lot of ways you can be wise. But the one way that I hope you will be wise, the most important way to be wise, is what Paul says, wisdom unto salvation. And that is, how do I get saved? Is it by becoming a good person and joining religions and becoming a religious person and following a set of religious rules and, and striving and, and, and then keeping my fingers crossed, hoping that when I die, God's that was good enough, you get in. That's what the religions of the world teach. That's what well, that's the philosophy of the world. Uh, the, it's called the merit system. You go to heaven because of merit. The good people go to heaven. The not so good people go to hell. So we need you to understand that that's not God's way. The Bible says that's man's way, but it's wrong. God's way is through uh, the free gift of salvation. Now, if salvation is a free gift, that means that you don't have to work for it. Uh, otherwise, it wouldn't be a gift if you had to work for it. Uh, someone else did the work for you, Jesus. He lived a perfect, sinless life, and nobody else has ever done it. We, No matter how much we strive to be good and perfect, we can never reach this level of perfection that God requires. So... Uh, but Jesus did. He did that perfect work, and we get credit for his good works, for his perfect work, because of our faith in him. Uh, you cannot buy the free gift of salvation. You can't get, make charitable donations. You can't pay tithes to a church. You can't buy your way into heaven. Jeez, but Jesus already bought it for you. Bible says that you were bought with a price, with the blood of Jesus Christ. He paid for your salvation with his blood and his death. Uh, so that's what you need to understand. If, if you understand that trying to work your way to heaven is futility, it's impossible. And then you can, as we were talking earlier about the word humility, maybe you'll come to a point where you'll be humiliated and say, I... I'm a failure. I can't get to heaven through my I could never be perfect. And when you reach that point, you can say, I guess I need a savior. Well, guess what? There is a savior, but there's only one. Jesus said he's the one and only savior. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. <laughs> That's pretty bold claim, isn't it? But he said he's the one and only way to go to heaven. He's the only savior. So if you realize that you need a savior, now I hope you understand Jesus is the savior, the one and only savior. It's not Buddha, it's not Muhammad, it's not the Pope, it's not the Virgin Mary, it's Jesus. So if you will put your faith in Jesus and no longer put your faith in your own efforts, your own ability, that's when you receive the gift of eternal life. Now, I want you to know who he is and what he did for you. That's important to understand. He's not merely a prophet. Uh, he, he's not some, uh, some kind of a creature that God made. He's eternal. Uh, he's not just a moral teacher. He's eternal God Almighty. He, 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 the Bible says that he's eternal God manifest in the flesh. God made flesh. He became a man named Jesus. And the Bible says the reason he became a man was in order to die for our sins. And he did. He died on a cross. You've probably heard about this. What was accomplished on the cross? All of our sins, the sins of the whole world, the, all the sins of all people who've ever lived were put on Jesus on that cross. The Bible says he became sin for us. In other words, all the sin was put on him. It was just nothing but sin on that cross. And when he died, he paid for all of our sins. So now, uh, sin is not a barrier that separates us from God. We can come to God. We can have a relationship. We can live with God in heaven because Jesus paid for our sins. But you can't do it unless you come to Jesus and receive the gift. So put your faith in him. He'll give you eternal life in heaven. Now, something else happened. After he died, he was buried. But after three days, he raised himself from the dead bodily 
And uh, some people try to spiritualize it and you know think it's just a, a fable or a story or an allegory or something where it's symbolic. But no, it's it's literal. He was literally raised from the dead bodily, and. And he said that he would do it in advance. He promised that he would do it. And he said he would raise himself from the dead as a sign to prove that he is God, Savior, and he has power over life and death. And he did. He uh, And I believe it because there were witnesses. He walked with on the earth in the flesh for 40 days among 500 witnesses. They saw him, they talked with him, they touched him, they ate with him. And the resurrection is the proof that convinces me that my faith in Jesus is justified. So we're just asking you to trust Jesus. Now that you know who he is and what he's done for you and, and what you need to do to go to heaven, will you put your faith in Jesus now? All right, brother, I'm going to end the broadcast. Any last words? Well, if you've decided to put your trust in the Lord, you're going to be talking to God quite a bit. The best thing to do the first time you talk to God would be to say something like this. Dear Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for my sins and being buried and rising again the third day to give me new life. I receive it. In Jesus name now just go and love one another okay back to you yeah beautiful great way to end the broadcast brother uh, join us nightly 7 p.m. Pacific time bless you all in the name of our great Savior God Jesus Christ <laughs>